you get a secret, and you get a secret, and you get a secret. This video contains spoilers for Xandria Unlimited Calamity Episode 3. Hello everybody, my name is Luna and welcome to Crit Roll Conspiracies, the show where we talk about all the wild and wacky theories that critters have about Critical Role. Once again, we got a jam-packed episode, so let's get straight into it. We pick up at the battle with Dean Lycretia Hollow. But Dean Hollow is not the only one there. There is my friend, your friend, Myla's friend. <laughs> Was that a good joke? <laughs> <laughs> now, Milus is the person that came and asked Nidus about extra ether in the very first episode, kind of sniffing around to see if there would be some like shady dealings to do with excess energy in the city. Derrett notices that when Milus walks through the door, he kind of stoops a little, which is odd given the size of the doorframe. And he kind of determines that this person is disguising what they actually look like. And this turns out to be true as Milus reveals himself later to be a true devil. Here are some highlights from the battle. Nidus summons a draconic spirit, the spirit of the first dragon, to sit upon this mountain. And the spiritual form of Shao Kuozhan uh, appears and says, as the gold, you see that uh, its spirit appears as the gold piece leaves, the first gold piece that was taken from its hoard, and its spirit is summoned in its ghost, grasping for its old hoard. Oh, no. uh, and the coin disappears in midair, reappearing in your pocket, uh, and it turns to you and says what it has said every time you summoned it before. Is my memory mocked anew? Wow. It says that every time? Every time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes, it's my. Yes, Shao Shan. Enemies ahead! Serret gets his memories about Vespin's belongings sucked out of his mind. He looks at you, reaches forward as he comes out of invisibility, grabs your face, puts his forehead to your forehead, and goes, The tools of Vespin Chloris! And you feel a detect thoughts shoot into your head. Oh! And you immediately, unbidden, think of Orwin, the chamber, the report, what you told him to do. With. Oh, no. oh. Laren reverses gravity. Lycretia looks at you uh, at P and Patia underneath that tower and says, Running away? I wouldn't do it! Uh, and goes straight up, uh, uh, straight up, all of the canal uh, ass over tea kettle. Loquacious spends most of the time feeling very conflicted about what to do. This is Loquacious Seely saying, Seely, you later. <laughs> Unbelievable. Xerxes deals over a hundred points of damage in one round. So you see. You see one swipe, but then you start to see these after images of like these sort of uh, 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 ephemeral uh, uh, cosmic dust and divine light just do the same exact repetition of it, like echoes of that strike. <laughs> and speaking of Xerxes, this week we got confirmation about his subclass. He is a Oath of Redemption paladin. We learn this both from the interview with Louise posted on the Critical Role website, as well as the fact that he has Counterspell, which is one of these spells available to Oath of Redemption paladins. Also, Xerxes can now speak and understand Infernal, although at first he doesn't realize that that's what he's doing. He turns to Lycretia and says, stand down, this was not the deal. And Lycretia responds, bring him here and we will honor this arrangement. And I think this is when Xerxes realizes that maybe he's made a bad choice. While the battle is happening, there are attacks happening all over the city, attacks on the arcane batteries, which store the city's energy and help power it and also keep the energy required for the replenishment. Plus, the arboreal calyx at this time is trying to draw massive amounts of power. Laren tells her team in the arcane heart to put stop gaps and measures to stop the arboreal calyx taking so much energy. Serret dashes into the helm and sees the helm shattered as well as Akami Ro, the helmswoman, dead on the floor. There is no way to stop it now. The city is going to descend. Laren and Loquacious dimension door to one of the batteries and manage to fend off the attackers and they save it from being destroyed. That's just one out of 12 though. For the spectacular finish to this battle, Patia casts Otoluk's Resilient Sphere, but Lycretia counterspells her spell. But then Xerxes counterspells Lycretius's counterspell, and then two of the Infernal Mages try to counterspell Xerxes's counterspell, but they fail. So Patia casts her sphere just as Lycretia is casting Circle of Death. So she goes, I've always hated you. And you scintillating blue energy, the blue of brimstone. Yes. 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 
uh, withering her own skin. <laughs> the spell escapes and recurses and recurses and recurses. And she drops. After the battle, which was like three hours long, the episode takes a break and we're going to take a super quick break so I can tell you about my podcast, Flump Friends. This is the podcast in which I chat all things D&D and tabletop RPGs. I have interviews with other D&D creators and writers, as well as lore and monster deep dives and advice about running your game and the latest RPG news and product releases. You can listen to the first episode for free by following the link in the description and you can get all of the episodes for just $5 a month either right here on YouTube when you sign up as a member or by subscribing on my Patreon. Okay, back to the calamity. Brennan has the players roll to see how many of the batteries survived. One of them is an automatic success because of Laren and Loquacious' intervention, and then against all the odds, and with two natural 20s in a row from Sam, only one battery is destroyed, so it could have been a lot worse than it was. Because of the plane shift earlier today and the loss of one of the batteries, there isn't enough energy to do both plane shifting the whole city, which Laren wants to do, and fulfilling the requirements of the replenishment. Laren orders that the tithe will not be met, the replenishment will not be given, making her the first arcane artificer since Avalir was lifted up off of the mountain to not fulfill the Doshari pact that was made centuries ago. We took the top of a mountain into the clouds. It was always about reaching. And we're just reaching a little farther and it's scary and we have to break rules to do it. But if it works, it will be worth it. It has to be worth it. Laren talks about wanting to leave a legacy and to be remembered. And the most tragic thing about this is that we know from modern day events in Exandria that she will not be remembered. Her achievements, both great and terrible, will not be remembered because almost nothing is known from that period of history. It was all for nothing. Unless Avalir did actually plane shift and it's still out there. Maybe we'll find out next week. It's at this moment that Loquacious presses Laren for more detail. He wants to try and understand why she wants to do this because for him, everything is great here in Avalir. They've got everything they need, everything is plentiful, and he just doesn't understand her drive and her ambition. But even though he doesn't understand, it is clear that he loves her dearly and he will do anything to protect her. There are a lot of stories in Exandria of mortals who stumbled their way into the Feywild and fell in love with an enchanting fairy that they met there. But there's one story of a fairy who stumbled into this world and fell in love. I'd like to record a message. Oh. Yeah. Like a, a message to be played upon my disappearance or death or something mm -hmm. where I uh, I talk about a great evil that show, that reared its head on the day of our uh, landing and the powerful forces that tried to keep it quiet, but one voice, one voice was strong enough to see through and, uh, and tell the truth and expose the lies and, uh, and that was Laren and I stood in her way and wouldn't let the truth come out because I was afraid that it would worry the citizens too much and submit my resignation as the, the, the herald of Avalir. But I, I don't release that. It's just, uh, it's on a crystal somewhere. Uh, Avalir's greatest reporter who dedicated his life in the service of the truth knows the importance of a good lie. And you preserve this story that is very dear to you in Crystal. Patia, Xerxes, and Nidus come together again, and over their psychic connection with the others, they sort of brainstorm and try and work out what they're going to do, and sort of figure out all of the different threads and different clues that they've picked up along the way. This is when we get the absolute bombshell that Patia knows more than she's letting on. She knows about what happened to Evandrin. Xerxes. What if he's not dead? What if he's something else? What would that possibly be? You asked to not remember. 
and I oblige. What are you talking about? <laughs> We've been friends for decades. I've been around for a long time, and I don't know if I've ever seen a desperation quite like yours when you came to me. You remember coming to me? I do. I remember coming to you, but I remember that we agreed not to talk about that. Do you want to talk about it? Is it relevant now? I was desperate for help. Vandrin was dying, so I, I came to ask for help to see if there was a cure. I was convinced that I'm this place had a cure. I'm only bringing it up because it seems relevant. When Evandrin faded away, Xerxes came to her, asking for her help, asking her to look into the scrolls and the books and the tomes in the library to find anything that could bring Evandrin back. She attempted an ancient ritual, an old magic that was essentially forbidden, but it didn't work. It was as if Evandrin had never existed in the first place. It's at this point that Brennan chimes in to let Marisha know that if Paisha wants to restore Xerxes' memories, she can. So the party physically reconvene, but before she can restore those memories, Xerxes casts Zone of Truth, essentially wanting everyone to get on the same page. He's kind of tired of all the secrets coming tumbling out, which honestly, I think is a little bit rich given that he swore an oath to a betrayer god and he hasn't told anyone about it, but... You know, Paladin's gonna Paladin, I guess. Xerxes, Seret, and Nidus choose to fail their saves, whereas Laren and Loquacious both succeed. Paisha tries to, but rolls a natural one. Nidus clashes with Xerxes, saying, like, this is not the time to be doing this. Like, why are we doing this now? We all have our secrets. We all have our reasons for our secrets. Like, we need to be focusing on other things. Paisha restores Xerxes' memories and he once again feels this sense of failure that even though he tried everything he could, he couldn't bring Evandrin back. Paisha makes a stone cold guess in Brennan's terms that if Evandrin did not come back with a true resurrection spell, it's because he must be somewhere else. He must not be dead. With these memories restored, Laren finally reveals what she knows as well. Evandrin, as the first knight of Avalir, volunteers to go on her little plane shift expedition, and it worked. He went somewhere, and then he came back, and it seemed to work fine until, for some reason, he started fading away. Firstly, I want to say congratulations to all of you in my comments who predicted this, because there were quite a few of you out there, so well done. Then, to delve deeper into the realm of memories. During the battle, Nidus extracted some memories from one of the assailants, and he and Paisha go through them while she records them with her arcane focus. We actually haven't talked at all about her arcane focus and how she is able to record and kind of pull things into it for storage. Personally, my theory is that Paisha has the keen mind feat, so that's the feat that lets you remember everything with basically perfect recall for like 30 days, and they're probably just flavoring it to just be like forever. She just like puts it in her focus and she'll always remember it. Or it could also just be that this is some homebrew cool flavor stuff given that we're in the age of Arcanum where there is unlimited magical potential. In these memories, we learn a few things. They confirm that it was indeed Magister Cormorant who was bringing in these infernal assailants. Uh, he had been bringing them in for like over a week. They learn that Pervon was invited here so that he could be prevented from aiding in what was to come in Vasselheim. So I think we can assume that they're talking about the major assault the Betrayer Gods make on Vasselheim, which kind of kicks off the Calamity and the 200 year war. They also learn that there is an attack planned on the Galdrashari in Kathmoira and that it is probably happening as we speak. And there are also plans and schemes happening all over Exandria because, as we know, the Lord of the Hills is probably not the only betrayer god who is making moves right now. We also get a little gossip. It turns out that Paisha approached the Septarian and asked them to fund the Sorceress University, and when they wouldn't, uh, she basically convinced them by saying, well, if we bring all of the talent to Avalir and all of the prodigious students to Avalir, then it will be for the benefit of the city. So rather than it being a sort of charitable thing that these seven have done, it was a little bit more self serving, I suppose. Nidus doesn't really seem particularly bothered about this, and I must admit, I think the significance of it didn't really hit me either. Like, I, I didn't, it didn't seem like a very big deal. I wonder if we would have learned maybe a little bit more about the perspective of it if Nidus had accepted Paisha's offer to look into her memories and actually see the conversation for himself, but he's quite happy to just leave it at that. Seret, with a investigation check of 30, realizes that the mage's memories have actually been modified. The particular part where he heard Lycretia say, you know, they must not reach the Wild Mother's embrace. That's the part that has been modified. 
This whole time, we thought that these people wanted to stop the city from landing, but it turns out it's actually the opposite. The city needs to land and the replenishment needs to happen for whatever it is that they're planning. And then Seret makes, I think, probably one of the most relatable choices in this series for me so far. Jumping this lay right. I'm going to ask questions because I'm not an arcane user. So I'm, I'm trying to play big league with you guys now. Do we have to be docked to do it? With Kath Moira. Yes. None of this works if we don't dock. Whatever replenishment needs to happen. Yes, was all I needed. Evandra, mm -hmm. he went to this other place, came back, and was never the same again. Yes or no? Yes. And you want to send this entire city with our families to that place at that risk? Yes. I leave. Sarah leaves. Sarah heads to Cloudstone to Hawk's Nest to his office, and on the way, we get the most heart wrenching scene with his son, Kier, where he's talking to him on the Sending Stone and telling him to go and get his sister and meet him at the house as soon as possible. I think the fear in that moment was so tangible of a father just trying to get his family to safety. He arrives at his office and discovers that all of the papers there are gone, someone has cleared it out, and he also discovers the body of his partner, Orwin. Before his death, Orwin left a message for Seret using a magical item, which is a runes of recall. And he says, I don't know how much time we've got. These are for the kids. They're keyed to the mum." And he's left two, essentially, tickets, two teleporting tickets out of Avalir. And since there is only two, it looks like Sarat is not getting out of this city. I'm genuinely getting so emotional just like talking about this bit. I told you that this family was going to emotionally devastate me. Thinking of the mum actually and hearing about the tickets being keyed to the mum, like we don't know much about her except that she's a scientist and she's clearly away. Like she's not here at Avalir. What if she's a scientist in Aeor? That would be... I mean, I have no proof to back that up. I literally just thought of it. Actually, since we know what happened at Aeor, maybe I don't want her to be there. No, no, no. The kids aren't going there. They're going somewhere like very safe. They're going to be fine. The kids are going to be fine, okay? All but Seret head to the heart of Avalir and to the heart of this mystery, the Arboreal Calyx. Now, real quick, given that they can just walk into the Arboreal Calyx, like there doesn't seem to be any locks or spells or anything, why doesn't anyone know about the tree before? Did like nobody just ever go in there for centuries? I'm not sure if maybe that's just because things were sped along given how long the episode had already run. It just felt a little strange to me that it was just like, do, 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 do. I'm gonna go in this room, I've never been here before. Whoa, like, am I overlooking something here? I don't know, let me know in the comments what you think. The engine is built around this tree, which is hovering in the center of the room. And Loquacious notices the toy ship that Laren had sent off, uh, just kind of stuck in the branches of the tree. Like it's trying to come back. It's trying to come out of wherever it's like, translucided into. <laughs> That's a word, shut up. But it, it keeps getting stuck in the tree and it can't come back out. Xerxes attempts to speak to the tree in Primordial, but there is no response. Laren decides that she has to stop this tree. It is catching the things that she is shifting and it's catching her magic and she doesn't like that. Laren decides to cast Blight, but Nidus pleads with her and he shares the prophecy that he heard and how the tree cannot be destroyed because it will lead to the downfall of Avalir, but she sees the face of a Vandran kind of like whoo, whoo, in and out of the tree, stuck inside the tree, and she makes up her mind. And this is when the party begins to fracture. Nidus holds onto Laren, but Quay, using his fey presence, yells, unhand her. And Laren backs him up with silvery barbs, but because Xerxes is there, Nidus can't be frightened. Peisha couldn't care less about any of this. She casts legend lore, she touches the tree, and she starts having cosmic interstellar style visions. Uh, you see the tree of names, names. What has it been doing? The tree is a wall, the tree is a gate, the tree is a pen. Scribing blossoms, ley lines, writing, writing the names, the names. Petals falling all over Exandria. This was our bargain, Emir. You move back out. All of you watch uh, her touch the tree and see 
Uh, you see Pesha's hair stretch out behind her. Her eyes consumed with fire. She is rooted to the tree as though it is trying to draw her in and falls back out. Nidus casts Hold Person on Laren and Loquacious and he uses his sorcery points to heighten the spell. Xerxes grabs the letter about the tree out of Laren's pocket. Laren breaks out of the Hold Person and Pesha is continuing to have visions about her grandfather and an interaction with the head of the Galdrashari. Nidus continues to plead with Loquacious, but then Dwyoma, Laren's assistant, comes in and casts Disintegration on him. She heightens her spell as a clockwork sorcerer, but then Xerxes comes in with a counter spell. Laren breaks out of the hold person and yells to Xerxes that she saw Evandrin in the tree. Loquacious grabs onto Pacia and tries to pull her out of the tree, but he starts seeing visions as well. He sees the leader of his fey court, Elmenor of the Burning Veil. Vale. Real quick, we have heard the name Elmenor before in the first season of Exandria Unlimited. We learn that Elmenor was trying to get Fern from the Bell's Hells in Campaign 3 back to the Feywild. They're also briefly mentioned as an Archfey in the Tal'Dorei campaign setting, but we don't know anything else other than that. Pesha continues having birth of the universe godly visions. Nidus attempts to grapple Laren, and then two branches of the tree attempt to pierce into Loquacious and Pesha, and it's at this moment that Laren casts blight as we kind of cut into slow motion as this blight spell is coming forth to the tree Pesha sees visions of the two primordials who were never killed by the dawn father and the wild mother they were buried deep within the mountain and she sees the Galdrashari tending to those seals to make sure that they never escape again we learn a couple of really big things in this vision we learned that the Galdrashari built temples here to help reinforce those seals. After the wizards came and saw all of the broomstone in the mountain, they asked the Galdrashari to rise the city up and the Galdrashari agreed because they saw a benefit to the replenishment, to this bringing of magical energy to the land. But because they were so scared that the wizards were going to use the tree and use the seals to their advantage and in a detrimental way, they didn't tell them about what it was. So all of this knowledge about what this tree does and what the city of Avalir is doing has been lost. The Gaudrashari summoned the Tree of Names to travel with Avalir along the ley lines, essentially casting a giant spell of protection across Exandria as it traveled. A Bria's face in this moment! <laughs> Xerxes sees the face of Evandrin in the tree, who says, not like this, as the blight spell hits the tree. <coughs> Rot, and the tree sunders. <coughs> the seam opens along the trunk, and as it opens, there is only fire. Two arms push the tree apart, and the skinned face of Vespin Chloris gazes out. And behind him, you hear the true voice that has been speaking to you for quite some time. Very good, my little puppet. Vespin <coughs> crawls through. The tree sunders. <coughs> and the Lord of Hells gazes. <coughs> To be home again as the betrayer steps foot into Exandria. That's all for this episode. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I felt physically exhausted after watching that episode. It was such a roller coaster of emotions. So I think that this tree was the final stop point between the Betrayer Gods fully being able to come into the material plane. Because all of the Betrayer Gods had been released two weeks earlier, but they haven't been able to actually come out physically. The fact that their Apogee Solstice is happening, so all of the veils and borders between the realms are very thin, and there's the ley lines moving around so it's all very disrupted. That coupled with Laren casting Blight on this tree, I think is what has allowed them to come forth and come out into the Calamity. I mean, I know that the Calamity is obviously inevitable and we always knew this was gonna happen, but like, imagine knowing that your character 
is the one that did that. <laughs> Love you, Abria, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Something that at Ashton Graymore pointed out on Twitter, which kind of blew my mind, is that uh, the marble border that is around all of the players in this series over the last three episodes has slowly been getting more cracked and degraded. That is such a cool little detail that I totally didn't notice. Okay. Now it's time to talk about your theories. The problem with this series is that it is so quick paced and so much happens every episode that we don't really get time to talk about the theories before they're already proven or disproven. For example, a lot of you guessed that the Tree of Names was keeping the Betrayer Gods out. Confirmed. And you guessed that Evandrin wasn't dead but was plane shifted. Confirmed. And also, since the beginning of this series, a lot of people have been theorizing that the Galdrashari were the beginning of the Ashari also confirmed. There are a couple of other popular theories that were in the comments last week that we don't know about yet. The first being who is Loquacious's patron? I think it's pretty likely it's probably somebody from the Feywild and it could even be Elmanor from the Fey Court who we saw a little bit of this week. Another really fun theory is that Loquacious's patron is himself. Like I wouldn't put it past Sam to make a character that was just like so emboldened in his own personality and confidence that he was just drawing his own magical power from himself. <laughs> and the last very popular theory is that Avalir is going to be successful in plane shifting and that it is still out there somewhere waiting to be discovered. I really hope that's true and I really hope we get to see that next week. So let me know your theories in the comments about what you think is going to happen in the finale. How is this all going to play out? What is going to happen to these wonderful characters that we've met in such a short time but already are so attached to? You know the drill. There is a rumor going around that the finale for this series is about seven hours long. This rumor started because of some context clues on the Instagram takeovers that the cast did. If that is the case, I will be splitting Crit Roll Conspiracies next week into two parts because I just don't think I'll be able to finish basically two episodes, seven hours uh, in the same amount of time. So I'll let everybody know. I'll make a post about it if I do end up doing it in two parts, but yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I'd like to say a special thank you to my patrons and to my YouTube members, and I'd like to welcome new patrons, Senesra and Lev. If you'd like to sign up, all the details are down there. And until next time, I'm going to be thinking about the finale obsessively and slightly dreading it. Bye! Yes. Yes. As Xerxes says, we have time to tree. We have time to tree. We have time to tree. tree. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I don't know if that quote is going to make it in the final <laughs> recap.